Thank you so much for joining the NOAA Central Library today. We are excited to bring you another installment of the NOAA Innovators Seminar Series. Uh, before we get started, a few logistics. Everyone is muted, so if you do have a question, please place that in the question and or chat panel. If you are having any issues with your audio or visual components, GoToWebinar um, suggests that you log off and log back into the seminar. If you continue to have issues, uh, please reach out to me. I am Katie Rowley. Um, I will be hosting this and running the webinar side of things, but please just chat me. I will be uh, available to hopefully feel, uh, field any of those issues that you have. Uh, we are recording this seminar, so if you uh, miss the beginning or if you want to share it with a colleague or your network afterwards, the library does record and post all of our seminars on our YouTube channel after the fact. Um, we will hold all questions until the end of the seminar. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany House, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tiffany House, and I have the pleasure of introducing the speaker and briefly describing the Small Business Innovation Research Program. The Small Business Innovation Research Program supports scientific excellence and innovation through the investment of federal research funds and critical American priorities to build a strong national economy, one small business at a time. This is a highly competitive program which enables small businesses to create innovative products and services that benefit the NOAA mission and is responsive to greater market demands. NOAA's SBIR funding topic intended to create fluorescence-based solutions for a very focused need in coral reef research led to developing general purpose tools for detecting, viewing, and imaging fluorescence over a wide range of scales. The main products are an economical adapter for adding fluorescent superpowers to ordinary microscopes and flashlight solutions for handheld work in the lab and the field. The technologies are finding application in various disciplines and contributing to scientific discovery and research education and outreach and many commercial and industrial applications. Dr. Charles Maisel has an MS in Ocean Engineering from MIT and a PhD in Biology from Boston University. Charles Maisel has a diverse background working at small and large companies in academia and research, emphasizing marine-related work. Solving the challenges of finding and photographing fluorescence underwater led to a career shift into research on marine organisms, optical properties, including developing a novel diver operator underwater spectrometer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Maisel. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for that uh, the introduction, and um, thank you, Katie, and uh, and a thanks to the NOAA seminar series for um, you know, for inviting me to present here. You know, it's a pleasure to talk about a uh, you know what what we do, what I do at Nightsea, and um, and specifically today how that grew out of a NOAA SBIR. So. A subtitle for this talk could be How a NOAA SBIR Aimed at a Narrow Research Problem Spawned a Product Line with Widely Diverse Applications, Creating the Foundation for a Modest but Successful Company. So this started with a, uh, a NOAA Phase 1 and 2 that took place from 2003 to 2006. The uh, solicitation called for fluorescence imagery for rapid estimates of the distribution and abundance of coral recruits, uh, which is, you know, sounds like a very specialized problem. And what, what coral recruits are, are baby corals. They're the new coral settling on a reef that will hopefully grow up to be uh, adult corals and create a healthy reef. Uh, I am now at Nightsea, the gears at Nightsea at the time. The, uh, I was at Physical Sciences Incorporated and the award went to uh, this, the SBIR was, was hosted at Physical Sciences uh, Incorporated. So the outline of what I'm going to talk about today is what the original challenge was. You know, why did NOAA put out this topic in the first place? 
what is fluorescence and how can it help this problem? What we did in the SBIR project, the approach we took and the, the technology that it led to, and how this has benefited both, uh, both the NOAA uh, initial mission, other NOAA missions, and uh, far beyond that. So the general problem area that this, this um, solicitation fell into is, is an area that's of interest to NOAA, which is, which is coral reefs. Uh, coral reefs are important ecosystems. Uh, you know, fish grow there, they protect the coasts. Uh, there's a lot of information on that, so I'm not going to go into that. But, you know, we all appreciate that, that uh, coral reefs are beautiful and valuable, and people want to know, are they healthy? You know, what, what, what's happening with them? Now, one of the kind of things that, that people would do in, in evaluating a coral reef, you know, in the questions of health, is you look at the state. You would go out and you'd do a survey. And one of the common things to do is what's called a, a population size frequency. You go out. You do surveys, it could be diver transects, it could be video transects, and you literally count the corals and how big they are. And this tells you something about the state of the reef. Uh, and it's a, it's a common technique. Now, if we look at this, this uh, representative size frequency distribution that, that came out of a paper, we notice that at the small end is four to six centimeters diameter. That's you know two to you know two to over uh, you know over uh, you know, over two inches you know one, one and a half to two inches. Coral recruits, the baby corals that we're interested in in this in this problem, are about a millimeter in diameter. By the time they're a centimeter, they're about a, six months to a year old, which means that this kind of survey completely misses the early life history of corals. So. There's certain questions that, that were that were difficult to answer when it comes to recruitment. When it comes to this question of our new corals settling on reef surfaces, there's a lot that could not be answered well. So you want to know are new corals settling? If so, how diverse are they? Do they survive? What happens to them? Early life. What about the structure of the adult population? Is it driven by the recruitment process, or is it driven by survivorship? So let's say we have these, you know, we're going to pretend these three circles are two, three different species of corals that are uh, dominant on some reef. Now, the question is, is that all that landed on the reef? Were little babies of those species what landed on the reef and ended up growing into those adults? And that was it. Or were there more species that landed, you know, that, that arrived from the coral spawning process, landed on the reef, settled originally, started to grow? but didn't make it. So you can't answer that question if you can't find the babies. So the challenge, as we said, they're very small. So this is a photograph of a, uh, taken underwater, you know, of a small area of reef. And it's a complex environment for anybody who's been on a reef or, or seen uh, movies, you know that there's a lot down there. It's a, it's a complicated surface. This photograph is only about seven and a half centimeters wide and about three inches. Well, that means that in that there are 5,625 square millimeters in this image, this little image, and just one of those 5,625 is a baby coral. So what do you do about that? Now, so, the phone was ringing here. Uh, just one of those is a baby coral. How do you find it? So one approach that, that researchers took, because they couldn't find these babies on the reef, is they would put out settlement tiles, essentially eight inch square tiles. Uh, they'd put them on the reef in different depths and orientations, leave them out there for months, bring them back after things had grown on them, and um, uh, then look at them under the microscope. And to the right here are a couple, uh, you know, a couple images that were taken through a microscope. And it's still a pretty complex uh, area things aren't jumping out. So this is the problem. This is why there were there were not good techniques for researchers to uh, to find these things. So why fluorescence? Why was fluorescence an approach to help you with this challenge? So first of all, what is fluorescence? Very generally, it's the absorption of electromagnetic energy at one wavelength re-emission at another. In practical terms, for what people use it, you know, in, for many applications, what we use it here. It means you shine one color of light on something and a different color comes out. 
And people mostly associate this with ultraviolet. We're used to ultraviolet, you know, black light posters, and you shine this UV light and then you get all kinds of colors out. But it doesn't have to be black light. In fact, you can shine blue light on it and get out greens, yellows, reds. It's always moving down towards lower energy. And in fact, we had found that blue light was actually the best thing to use underwater for most marine life. It was the best thing for making corals light up and um, uh, you know, it, it's a useful tool. So any wavelength can potentially produce fluorescence in different things, but you, you pick the one that's best for the problem. So as an example of how this can work for you, this image shows granules of a plastic. These are the kind of things that are made by the, by the billions that are used for injection molding. You can see the scale by there of what's two millimeters. And these are the raw material that's used in injection molding. Well, some of these have a process defect in the polymerization called gel. And you'd like to see that. Well, here's a white light image, and there's not a lot jumping out at you. But if we light this up, if we, if we put the right excitation light on it and look at the fluorescence, the defects just glow and are easy to detect. So this is the general benefit of fluorescence is that, is that when something lights up, while well, everything else around it stays dark or lights up a different color, it's easier to see it. And this is what you wanna do with corals is you wanna make them easier to see. So how do you do this? How do you do fluorescence? What are the tools? Well, I'm just gonna illustrate this. This is a, uh, on the stage of a microscope. We're not gonna use the microscope right now, but that's a fluorescent mineral. And here it is under white light. So the two ingredients is really basically two ingredients for fluorescence. One is you need a light source that's gonna excite the fluorescence. So here now we're shining a bright blue light on that mineral, on that rock. Now the fluorescence is happening, but you can't see it because it's a, you know, you're shining bright blue light. A lot of blue light is being reflected and that's dominating what you're seeing. So the fluorescence is happening, but it's kind of buried, it's lost underneath that strong blue light. So what you need now, the other ingredient that you need is a filter that's going to remove, selectively remove that blue light and leave the fluorescence. And now we see that this mineral has this gorgeous green and red fluorescence that's in this image, but hidden underneath all that light. So light source and appropriate barrier filter are the ingredients to see fluorescence. And now let's take this back underwater. And we'll take that same area of the reef and I'm gonna make it easy. We're gonna put an arrow pointing right at the one millimeter of interest in that scene that you would never pick out in white light. But if we look at that, lighting it up with blue light, looking at it through a filter, that green dot right there, less than a millimeter in diameter is a baby coral. So fluorescence, this is why fluorescence, it was of interest. And it was not that we proposed this, though it was not that the question was not, how can I find baby corals? The question was, we want fluorescence tools for looking at coral recruits. So that's what led to the SBIR, you know, so why did the SBIR happen and, and why, did, why did it come to us? Well, there was awareness that fluorescence was a potential tool for coral reef research. And, and that, you know, I had, I had been the one who had developed the early equipment for, uh, for doing fluorescence diving and had uh, put some stuff out there. So people knew that it existed, but nothing had been done to specifically address the needs of researchers. So I was well positioned when this, when this SBIR solicitation came out. Uh, I was at the time, I was a principal research scientist at Physical Sciences Incorporated in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, a wonderful company full of, full of great scientists and engineers that's very active in both SBIR and non-SBIR research and development. And NITSE, uh, which was the, the uh, eventual path for commercialization, already existed as a subsidiary of PSI. When I joined PSI, I brought this basic technology with me and I had joined with them to start this small company uh, as a, in a partnership to provide lights, filters, and photo accessories to scuba divers. I mean, that was, that was all the goal was at the time, uh, it was just the general scuba diver community. But this is why when the solicitation came out, 
uh, obviously, it, uh, I was an obvious person to respond to it, and uh, we, we got the award. So the approach for the SPIR, uh, we had the goal to develop fluorescence-based tools to meet the needs of researchers. And we wanted to address both working in situ, working underwater, searching, and uh, both day and night, working in the laboratory, so working with settlement tiles, and at different scales. It scales from the, you know, just the eyeball, looking, looking again, searching underwater, uh, by eye, but also magnified, looking under the stereo microscope and seeing if fluorescence would help there. I needed a, a, a science collaborator who was, who was an expert in coral reef research, and I worked with Dr. Lena Schmont from the University of North Carol Carolina in Wilmington, and uh, also collaboration from our, our NOAA uh, technical contact, Dr. Andrew Bruckner. And the, the approach was, was uh, iterative equipment development and field work. So we would come up with ideas, make things, uh, you know, at home in Massachusetts, go to coral reefs, try them out, see what worked, what didn't work, uh, go back to the lab, improve them with the goal of developing useful tools for the coral reef research community. And the aim was that uh, the commercialization of this would be through Night Sea LLC, which again at that time existed as a subsidiary of PSI. So several different technologies did come out of the SBIR. One was an improved flashlight for working in situ, working underwater. So I had already had some flashlights, uh, but they were based on earlier technologies. And right around the time that uh, the SBIR was happening is when blue, uh, bright blue LEDs were, uh, you know, first became available, and we were early in building them into underwater flashlights. So you've got the flashlight, and then for the barrier filter, uh, you'll see that yellow um, uh, visor. This was something that a diver could wear over their mask so that when they swam around in the dark, they could light the surface up with the blue light, look through the visor and see, not see the blue, but see the fluorescence. And then below that is a, is a, uh, a wrapper that just prevents you, uh, you, you put that around the strap so you don't lose the uh, filter during the dive, which I, I did more than once. So that was one was just basically better flashlights, more practical. Another one was to address the question of working in the, in the daytime, because even for, for researchers, it's not always practical, not always safe to go night diving. Uh, it's got extra difficulties beyond day diving, but how do you see fluorescence in the daytime? It's a weak effect and it's easily overwhelmed by ambient light. So I, I used something that, uh, a trick that I picked up on, and, and ideally you're gonna see uh, your, your attention is hopefully drawn to a circle uh, on the right that is flashing. It's not very strong contrast, but if you look carefully over to the left, uh, there's another one of those circles not flashing. And you can see that it's a lot easier to see the blinking circle than it is to see the non-blinking one. So by making a light in which the excitation, the blue light actually blinked and wearing the filter, then as you swam around in the daytime, and if you looked at the reef surface carefully, even a very tiny thing that was fluorescing would blink back at you, making it easier to find. You could then switch over to the steady light to look at it in detail. So we still use this in, in uh, trick in some of the flashlights that we make. The other aspect was in looking at the uh, settlement tiles, you know, not replacing the, for, the uh, microscopy technique they were already using, but looking at whether fluorescence microscopy would be an improvement over the white light microscopy and finding things on these, on these surfaces. So here's a settlement tile under, under white light. Here's the same tile in fluorescence. You can already see that there's more contrast. There's new things being seen. Now, if we look at this under the microscope, here's an area of a very small area under, under white light and the same area in fluorescence. And you can see that coral glowing nicely green in the darkness. Another area that just looks like a mess. There's just a canopy of, of algae. This is uh, you know, seaweed essentially, macroalgae growing on this tile. And it's like looking through the canopy of trees. It's really not obvious what you might be looking for in this image, but with fluorescence, there's a nice little tiny green dot, probably a millimeter in diameter, 
glowing that's now easy to see. All the algae glows red because of uh, the, its chlorophyll. Chlorophyll that's there for photosynthesis happens to fluoresce its nice red, but you've got the green fluorescence from the coral making it easy to see. So, so we demonstrated that, that fluorescence microscopy was better than white light microscopy for looking at these settlement tiles. So this was a good answer, but it was not a good solution. And the, the challenge was that fluorescence micro, stereo microscopes, this is, these are stereo microscopes, not the higher powered compound microscopes. This is what was used. Uh, if, if you're gonna go to try to buy one of these from the major manufacturers, they're terrific. They're fantastic pieces of equipment, but they're very expensive and they're laboratory equipment. They're not super rugged. There were some fluorescence add-ons for stereo microscopes, but they're very microscope specific and also quite expensive uh, and, and, and not rugged. Now, they're good things, but the challenge is coral reef researchers are generally not well-funded. So the, the expense of that could be prohibitive for many people. Shipping these microscopes back and forth to uh, field locations, you know, whether it's in the Caribbean or Pacific, uh, you know, it's not the best idea to be boxing these things up and shipping them back and forth all the time. And the tropical climates that you're asking them to work in are not always instrument friendly. You're not always in a nicely air conditioned laboratory. Often these things are exposed to heat and humidity. Again, not a great thing for, for uh, these wonderful fluorescent stereo microscopes that were, were really scientific instruments. What was needed was a simple, rugged, inexpensive, general purpose add-on meant to do just one job sea corals. One of the reasons the, the good, you know, the high-end fluorescence microscopes are expensive is they're very general purpose. And we just set out to do one thing. What if we just replicate what we need to see the corals? Can we put that on a stereo microscope in a simple way? So that led to a, a uh, the, the prototype that came out of the SBIR program, the uh, prototype stereo microscope fluorescence adapter. And it had these uh, two blue LEDs on the side. There was a, a machined framework that, that attached where a ring light would attach to the microscope. There was also, in this case, there was a white LED. Uh, you'll see a yellow barrier filter shield, but there's also a barrier filter mounted underneath this so that when you look through the microscope, you're looking through that. And there was a control box uh, to switch the LEDs, turn things on and off. So this was, this was a prototype. It worked. Uh, it, it was not a, a product. And like, uh, like things often happen, uh, you know, this, this languished a little bit. Uh, it didn't turn into a product right away. One of the things that did turn into a product right away was replacing the diver filter visor with, with filter glasses. We found a, a source for very high quality glasses that would work in combination with the lights. And it turned out that researchers were using uh, fluorescent proteins. That's a whole wonderful story in itself. But with these fluorescent proteins that were originally discovered in a jellyfish, you could actually uh, add fluorescence to organisms so that they actually uh, incorporate it in their genes and their offspring can carry the fluorescence. And this has proved to be a, just a phenomenally valuable um, tool for research. It's a, it's a great story in itself, which we don't have time for, but researchers wanted to do things like if you look at these two uh, you know, mouse uh, pups on the left, uh, in white light, they look the same, but you want to know which one carries a trait that is of interest for your research. Because when you have offspring, they don't always carry what the adult does. So now if you can make fluorescence be associated with what you're interested in, now the one that lights up is the one that you want for the next stage of your experiment. So it's, it's a, just a tool for selecting things. And then these two uh, you know, beautiful fluorescent mice. Again, the researchers there didn't really care that the mice were fluorescent for the fluorescence. It just helped them pick those mice for knowing what they needed for their experiments. So it just, it just streamlined the technique. So we started selling these flashlights and filter glasses for above water work into laboratories. And this led to the real breakthrough which is I got a phone call from a, a researcher who worked with Drosophila. These are fruit flies, which are really the, a wonderful model organism used for research. And they're, they're, uh, they're the core of a lot of the understanding of uh, early understanding of genetics. So they're uh, an important thing. And this guy 
uh, called me up and he had been going to buy a fluorescence microscope for, for a lot of money and he found our flashlight and filter glasses and he was actually wearing the glasses and holding the flashlight to sort his little tiny fruit flies because they're millimeters long and sort, sort them under the microscope. And he called me up and said that the community needed this. And uh, I ended up going to the Drosophila Research Conference in 2011. What he didn't know when he called me is that I had this prototype for the microscope adapter. So I redid that, that prototype into a more practical uh, form. It still wasn't a product. And I went to the research conference in 2011 and I showed people this and I said, do you want this? Do you want this you know, easy add-on capability to your existing microscopes? And do you want what I have here in front of you? And the answer was absolutely, they wanted that. They, they wanted this inexpensive tool. But what I had was just the one wavelength, the same wavelength for the corals with the uh, blue excitation and the filter to see, uh, you know, just to block the blue. But by that time, they were using multiple colors of these fluorescent proteins and they needed more than that. So the single wavelength system was not the solution. So I said, okay, I'll be back. And I was back at the next year's conference with uh, pretty much what's the current version of this adapter. So here we're going to, you know, just show you basically what this, what this consists of and what the principles are. So we'll start with a stereo microscope. Again, these are the lower powered microscopes, often called, also called dissecting microscopes, uh, that have a lot of work area underneath them. They're called that because you can work underneath them. And uh, very commonly they have this uh, you know, they, they end up in the bottom like this where you can attach a ring light, try, attach an accessory. So we use that and we have an adapter ring that goes where that ring light attaches and it's oversized. The thumb screws make up the difference. It's pretty much universal. It's not completely universal. And we have alternative adapters for different microscopes. So we've you know, developed additional solutions, but this works on 90 something percent of stereo microscopes. And there's nothing in this adapter ring, it's empty, but it's got magnets. So when you want to attach a barrier filter, it just sticks on underneath and holds that way. In this way, it's modular. If you, you can put in the appropriate barrier filter for whatever, whatever excitation wavelength you're using. Similarly, we add a filter shield that matches the barrier filter. And this is just for eye protection. So when you're working at the microscope, you're not seeing the bright light on the stage, but it's also a filter. And with many subjects, you can just look through this and see the same fluorescence that you would see through the microscope. So this handles the filter side of things. And for the excitation side of things, we have a freestanding uh, lamp base and the light heads attach with a, with a removable connector. So this way, again, it's modular. You can easily remove that light head, replace it with a different color light head for looking at different fluorescence. Uh, different things need different excitations in order to respond. And, and that's it. I mean, that's the core ingredients. And then there's variations for uh, solving particular system problems. So the, the, the features of this, the characteristics, it's now, it's modular and we have six different excitation emission combinations. The whole thing is it attaches in less than a minute. There's a video on the website. You can watch me uh, putting this on a microscope in 34 seconds and I'm not rushing. And it doesn't require disassembly or modification of the microscope. It really is an add-on uh, that you can easily put on, take off. It's inexpensive. It's just over $1,000, gets you a complete one wavelength set, 555 adds you an additional color. This is for stereo microscopes. So it's a very easy entry uh, price point. Uh, it doesn't interfere with ordinary white light use. If you take away the, the uh, barrier filter, your microscope is unchanged. And now over time, we've introduced variants for use with uh, things, uh, you know, small digital, small digital microscopes, a large, very expensive digital microscope. So we've partnered with any number of companies now in order to make variants of our system uh, to work on their, on their microscopes. And we've also added many accessories along the way. A lot of this is coming out of you know, needs that you know, either we've identified or more often it comes from uh, people asking us, hey, you know, can, can we do something? 
So in the upper left, uh, we, we ended up, uh, people were, were putting our system on microscopes that were not in dark rooms, and sometimes it was hard to see, so they were creating makeshift enclosures. So we in, invented and, and patented the, uh, our, quote, tent of darkness that you can put around a stereo microscope, and it, it, it's dark in there. And then because we're low power and running on LEDs, uh, you can run the whole system on, off a battery. So there I am doing fluorescence, setting up on a portable table on the beach in uh, Cape Cod. And uh, just above it, you can see a fluorescence image of a barnacle made, uh, made in the field. Uh, on the lower left, people wanted more intensity. So we could run two light heads from one base using appropriate cables. And we made these little little hanger baskets that would attach to our adapter ring. So you could double up the intensity, or we've got an option where you could put two different colors there and then switch back and forth between them very easily. Uh, in response to another customer's request, we added a dimmer control. There's several reasons why you might want to, uh, to dim the excitation. It can help in some cases increase contrast, or it can decrease the, uh, the uh, amount of light you're putting on something, some things are photosensitive. Uh, we added the ability to control the, the uh, light on off from an external connector. Sometimes people had experiments where they wanted to have the light on only for a very particular uh, period of time uh, for various experiments, so we've added that. So again, this is not by any means complete, but we, we, we keep adding to the, the product line in response to customer needs. So what are the benefits? This works with custom microscopes that the customer already owns. You're not buying a special purpose microscope and it's a nearly universal system for stereos and as I say we have adapters for others. You can easily move it between microscopes, take it on and off. You can use it in the field for demos, for outreach. Uh, at, the, at the price point it's at, it's practical to purchase multiple units for lab classes. This is not something I thought of originally, but the very first time I introduced it, people were saying, now I can teach genetics. Uh, it makes, in general, it's a workhorse tool that makes fluorescence much more accessible and opens the door to more widespread applications. So it's certainly serving its in, intended original application, which is corals. So NOAA uh, night sea flashlights and microscope adapters are, are being used around the world for work with corals, both with recruits and adults. Uh, there are over 60 published papers that we've identified that relate to corals, uh, that use our, that cite our equipment, and about half of these are directly re related to the recruitment question. And this is something that just came across our desk literally a week ago. We're in contact with a laboratory in uh, Qatar, uh, Marine Conservation Restoration Research, using our gear for exactly the intended uh, work with coral recruits and the questions of coral health. There are other marine related applications. There's a, a dye called calcine for staining fish that's used in fishery studies. And our, our equipment, usually the flashlights, but sometimes the microscope adapters are the light of choice for then finding these stained fish. What you do is you, you stain the fish, you put them back out, and then you wanna find them later on. We have a lot of customers at NOAA. So the gear is, is, is serving, already serving a lot of uh, NOAA, areas, some of it's coral, some of it's not, you know, several marine fisheries, environmental, uh, you know, satellite data information service, marine disease and restoration. So there's quite a few uh, NOAA customers uh, of the gear. So the, uh, the SBIR has led to tools uh, being used in-house. But what we found, and we keep finding are other applications, and we keep finding new ones or they find us. So there's, there's scientific research, as I showed earlier, uh, with the uh, fluorescent proteins, and there's both academic, uh, nonprofit, and industry applications there. Gear is being used for education and outreach, uh, microplastics, there's agriculture work, art conservation, forensic sciences, entomology, general industrial work in a number of areas. And I'm just going to show a few quick examples. So in scientific research, uh, widely used for genotyping, scientific visualization with these fluorescent proteins or fluorescent stains, and uh, you know, from the upper left, we've got a, an adult fruit fly, and then below that, we've got C. elegans, which is a nematode that's again an important organism for research. And then a, a zebrafish that has a, a fluorescent heart and a green fluorescent heart, and red fluorescent blood. 
and then there's our there's our nice uh, red fluorescent mouse. Education and outreach. Uh, gear is being used in lab classes. It's uh, being used in undergraduate research as a tool for, you know, they're just this workhorse tool for research. Um, there's a storefront science center in Missoula, Montana, that uses our gear and with fruit flies, giving, uh, you know, giving the community access to, uh, to research. And then we have owners of the gear who take our equipment out for things like science fairs so they can share it with the community, take it into middle schools. Uh, users in the art conservation field. Here's an image showing uh, an, a, a very detailed area of a 17th century painting on the left in white light, on the right in fluorescence. And we're actually differentiating between original paint and overpaint from, a, from an earlier repair. So uh, there's, other, there's other applications in terms of identifying pigments, analyzing cross sections, but it's, it's a, that's, that's a, you know, an emerging application. Forensic sciences. We have we have customers who are solving crimes. It's used to help in uh, trace evidence. Uh, when you're looking for fibers and looking for things that are left behind, sometimes you can see more in fluorescence than you can see in white light. This is a uh, a dust bunny, the kind of thing you collect in you know, your house if you don't vacuum enough. And uh, up at the top right here, it's under white light. On the left, it's under ultra fluorescing under ultraviolet light. And on the right fluorescing under blue light and these look like they barely look like you're looking at the same thing and yet these are exactly the same area there are things being revealed by fluorescence that you can't see in white light so it's a useful tool uh, in that application entomology uh, many there's some applications under the microscope there's also applications for the flashlight top two images are, are hornworms on uh, tomato plants these are these are a known pest and on the left in white light, these things are large, but they're very, very well camouflaged. On the right, you can easily see them going green while the chlorophyll in the plant fluoresce is red. Uh, lower left, the fluorescence of a grasshopper. There's a group that recently published a paper on using uh, the benefit of using fluorescence to find grasshoppers over white light for their surveys. Uh, there's people working on um, doing some work on fireflies that have not only do these things light up by themselves, they glow, but they have some fluorescent areas. And there we see under the microscope a uh, area of a firefly under white light and fluorescence. In industry, there's applications in uh, inspection and failure analysis. There are tools for highlighting cracks and things, fluorescent penetrants and magnetic particles. Uh, there's, there's techniques using fluorescent indicators for concrete thin section, pore analysis, uh, putting fluorescent dyes in cracks, looking at, um, at sectioned and polished electronic components. So many applications where you can see that fluorescence highlights things that people want to see. And this is just a, a smattering of the, of the applications of uh, fluorescence, and there, there's a lot more information and galleries of images on the NITC website. So just to look at the, the, uh, the, the business his side history of this, I joined uh, physical sciences as a scientist in uh, 1998. In 1999, we, we established NITC, you know, it's this technology that I brought in, was established as a subsidiary of PSI. The SBIR uh, that we're talking about here took place in 2003 to 2006. In 2007, I identified a application of, of the uh, flashlights at the time in the non-destructive testing market. It looked like a good business opportunity. I ended up um, forming Blue Line NDT LEC, LLC separate from, from uh, PSI. This was in uh, uh, agreement with them, with, uh, with the uh, technology novated to them, uh, novated from them with a, with a royalty uh, paid back to them in order to commercialize in the non-destructive testing market. In 2009, we, we dissolved NITC LLC, uh, and I took it under, under Blue Line. This is just because I was really running both. I, I was still at this time both at PSI and running this uh, small operation, but we took the NITC portion uh, under the Blue Line NDT. The uh, 2012 is when the stereo microscope fluorescence adapter was introduced. I, I went to that Drosophila conference in 2011, but the real product started in 2012. 
it started to take off. Uh, and I really saw that there was more than, than we could handle was the very small operation that I was. So I established a relationship with Electron Microscopy Sciences, which is a, a company that's a uh, got a very large catalog of both small and larger items for the lar laboratory market, very, very well established, very well respected in that market. And we established a relationship with them as the master distributor. Uh, gave us much more exposure in terms of their website, trade shows, that sort of thing. And in uh, 2020, uh, things had shifted in the Nightsea portion. We were, we were running Nightsea as a, as a DBA, doing business as of uh, PSI and uh, of, of Blue Line. And we just that dominated. So we made that the, uh, the dominant thing. And I, I personally separated from um, PSI in 2016. I formally retired. So, you know, we've done over 5 million in cumulative business. We just have a few employees. But again, with our relationships, there's a much broader reach, uh, a little bit of the impact. Our gear is is now in over over 1,800 research and educational institutions in 61 countries, uh, many U.S. government customers among them. Uh, just a, a smattering here on the slide. There's over 20 divisions at NIH alone, but many many parts of uh, you know of, of U.S. government organizations, uh, you know uh, uh, departments find use for our equipment. We keep track through a you know a Google Scholar search of of citations of our equipment, and again, we're it's a workhorse tool that's in the method section, but it's now up over 330 publications in more than 180 different journals, uh, and there, there's a link there on the slide you can get when you, you know, from the recording and, and get to that. But if you look at, at just the names of some of these journals, you know, there's the, you know, yes, there's coral reefs and there's limnology and oceanography and marine pollution bulletin, but there's also autism research, cerebral cortex, journal of field robotics, industrial crops and products. It's just, just a really diverse range of, of journals that uh, our equipment is, is uh, contributing to research that's showing up there. Future directions, we are just continue to expand into uh, the current markets, you know, the ones that we have already identified through direct outreach, but also more and more it's word of mouth. You know, the longer the gear's been out there, the more people hear about it from their colleagues. We're, we continue to identify new markets for the existing systems. And we also uh, continue to introduce system enhancements, new accessories, new products in response to market demands and opportunities. Often get the phone call, can you do this? And that leads to, uh, leads to new things that show up on the website. So in, in summary, uh, the pro NICE's products uh, really are a direct outgrowth of the NOAA SBIR. Uh, they've made the foundation of a small company. They're contributing worldwide to diverse areas of science, industry, education, and outreach. Uh, NICE has directly provided steady employment for several people. And has contributed to the economy in general through its relationships with vendors, distributors, and customers. Impact is demonstrated in the large number of equipment owners around the world and the growing body of publications in which Nightsea equipment is cited in methods. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're pleased and proud with the way that uh, we've, we've been able to grow this technology and uh, you know, be happy to be in communication with anybody who's on this call to, um, to uh, See, can we work with you? Uh, so, thank you. And if anybody wants, is ever wondered why we have a shark in our logo? It's based on this uh, fluorescent photograph of a of a shark. So, thank you, and uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Charles. This was this was awesome. I learned a lot. Um, I hope everyone did it as well. We did have a few questions come in while. Uh, while your presentation was going on. And the first one, I am sure I'm going to uh, stumble over because it's a specific name, but uh, can you detect uh, Mary Profundus ferrooxidans or other iron-eating bacteria which are particular in the sea? Give one of my favorite answers, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that specifically. I don't... Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if the questioner knows whether those things are inherently uh, fluorescent or whether they would be, you know, could be stained. So I would be happy for the questioner to 
uh, contact me. You can see the email there and, and we can address that question. Great. Okay, thank you. Our next question, have you tried using other types of light, non-LED? Uh, good question. I, you know, earlier on when I was doing things before the LEDs came out, uh, yes, we were doing that, but now uh, these days we're focused on the LEDs. Uh, there's, you know, ease, safety, costs, uh, various things. But again, if the questioner has um, specific things in mind, uh, I, I'd be happy for them to contact me directly. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Are the filters adaptable for cameras? Yes, uh, we can. Yes, they could be adaptable to cameras. We can actually also recommend uh, for most of the wavelengths we have, we can recommend commercially available equivalents. They may not be identical, but they'll get the job done. So uh, again, uh, whoever's asking that, please contact me. I'll happy to, to um, uh, direct you to the photography side of things. Okay, thanks. Uh, next, why is blue light preferred for underwater applications? Wonderful question. Why is blue light preferred? It seems it, it, it's a practical thing. There is no ideal wavelength. You know, that's this is this is welcome to the world, to the real world. Welcome to biology. There's a lot of variability. There's no one ideal wavelength. I started uh, when I started. I, I was using ultraviolet light. Uh, many, you know, I, I, I had the same misconception, preconception that many people have associated with fluorescence with UV. And I started diving. I made underwater UV lights. I, I built all my early work on underwater UV and modified cameras for doing underwater UV induced photography. And it's only when I got into research and it was actually this fluorescence work that turned me into a scientist. I started this as a sport diver. I ended up doing that PhD research, having access to equipment to measure what makes things fluoresce. And I was looking at a particular anemone and the data told me that blue light was better. And it was a revelation to me. And I ended up building a blue light. And I, and I had it on an early dive. I had this wimpy, weak blue light. And I had a really powerful UV light I had made. And I went on the reef and I scanned it with the UV. And then I, and I said, OK, this is fine. I'm happy. This is what I'm used to seeing. I put on this terrible blue light and it killed the UV. It just more things were fluorescing more brightly. Now, did I miss some things? Absolutely. Do you light up everything? Absolutely not. But your choice is pick what seems to be best for the environment. And again, that was a practical choice or dive with five different lights. Perfectly valid thing, but it's not the most practical thing to do. So the short answer is the experience and simply going into the world indicated that blue was, was a best choice. Again, if that whoever asked the question wants to get into this more deeply, please contact me. Great, thanks for breaking that down for us. Our next question, it appears that uh, it connects for saving images. Um, what type of connections does it have? So, yeah, so right, we do not save them. The system, the adapter does not save images. We do not, it's not an imaging system. It really is providing the illumination and the filtering. So in order to get the images, you know, as the previous uh, person asked, if you're using flashlights or, or you know, above water solutions, then you put a filter on your camera. Uh, mm -hmm. For the microscope, where you know all the microscope images I've got are recorded either with a uh, DSLR type camera adapted to the, the to a trinocular port to a camera port on the microscope, or um, I've had some uh, work with some digital cameras provided by microscope suppliers that go up there. I've taken pictures with uh, cameras that, that get inserted in add-ons that go in the eyepiece. And I've taken pictures just putting my, my uh, phone up over the eyepiece. So uh, our system does not take images. It, it provides the fluorescence, which you then image the way you would collect your images any other way. Thank you for clarifying. I did send you a question in the chat just so you could read the question as well as me reading it off because I want to make sure I that we're understood. Uh, we have uh, 
an asker who is saying, are you familiar with the blocks cut 420 sharp cutoff filter material? Uh, blocks uh, I'm not, 405. If, that, if that's a brand, I'm not specifically uh -huh. familiar with it, but I will certainly uh, make a note and look into it. There are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have various sources for the filter material we use, and I always try to stay, um, you know, try to stay up on what's out there, but that's, you know, I, I will look into that. Thank you. Great. Um, and I do know that Tiffany has a couple questions and I'm going to let her ask them. Hey, Charles, <laughs> this hey, was Tim. a great, this was a great presentation. I love all the colors and you explained everything so clearly. I feel like I learned a lot. I did have uh, one of my questions. You said that you, uh, when people ask for certain things, you make it for them. Now, do you make it custom just for them or is that available on your website for people to purchase? Thank you, Tiffany, good question. Um, sometimes we'll make something, occasionally we'll make something that just we're helping somebody out solve a specific problem. Ideally though, if we're gonna take the time to make something custom, it's because we think, oh, if we make this for this, somebody else may want it. So we, we balance that, you know, how much do we put into making that versus to what do we think we can do? But yes, there, uh, so, so there are a number of products on the website uh, that directly came out of customer requests that started out as specials uh, that we made for somebody specifically. And then uh, from what we learned there, we, we made it generally available. Okay, that makes sense and sounds great. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you had a picture up with the red mouse and the green mouse. What I didn't understand what was the difference between the two colors. I know you said you can see different things with the fluorescence, but what were we right. seeing with the green versus right. the red? Good, good question. Yeah, I didn't want to spend too much time getting all into all these things. So with with these fluorescent pro it's a general term these fluorescent proteins that are so useful in biological research the original one that was discovered uh, was called green fluorescent protein because it fluoresced green once scientists realized the value of this they were very interested in getting more colors so that they could see more things or they could let's say uh, have both green and red within an image and see two different things uh, and there's also very detailed things that, that make one color more appropriate than another that's beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, the point is there are, there are now many, many, many colors of fluorescent proteins. And people are making their choice of what they use for an experiment based on appropriate, appropriateness for their experiment. So those two mice, the one that fluoresced green, had been modified with what's called green fluorescent protein. And the one that fluoresced red had been modified with red fluorescent protein. And I'm sure the scientists did this in order to tag two different things. You know, they were not, again, they didn't care that the mouse skin fluoresced red or green. It told them something else about the biology of those mice, and this let them differentiate. So the different colors are used by scientists either because they're organism or the nature of the thing they're trying to do dictates that or uh, they're trying to highlight multiple things at once. So the, the green mouse and the red mouse had two different proteins added to them. I know it's still a little confusing, but hopefully that helped. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you both. Um, we do have one last question. Uh, Charles, would you mind sharing your presentation as a PDF with uh, anyone who requests it from this presentation? Um, I, well, wow, I'm gonna go back to, I don't know. I, I wasn't expecting the question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the presentation's being shared on YouTube. Yes, we will have a recording of it. So, so the recording is um, going to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to ask the the the, uh, the that person to then again contact me directly. Mm -hmm. In general, I I don't give out the presentations, but 
I'm mm -hmm. always happy to talk to somebody. Great. And I believe we have we have one more question, but I'm going to let you um, answer this one offline because it looks like you may have a new customer. So I will. <laughs> with that, I Come on, will give, me, give me a credit card over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah. will uh, we will send that question uh, to you offline. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, from Silver Spring, Maryland, and the snowy skies. I hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday. And we'll give you back a couple minutes in your day. Thank you, everyone.